We're about two minutes. We're in about two minutes after, so I'm going to get started. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And just a reminder: this is being recorded um, as part of our uh, work group meetings. I thank everyone for joining again, again today. This is our third work group meeting as part of our rate setting initiative for the long term care services. And on today's agenda. We're going to talk about why we're here, which is just a quick recap of the purpose of today's meeting. We're going to review input from the last meeting, um, particularly that about the question we asked about high cost trends and what to do about high cost trends. Got some valuable feedback there. We're going to talk through this year's approach to uh, developing trend and how we are planning to approach, uh, including our uh, data sources that we're going to use. And then we have some open discussions at the end. Uh, one is based off of today's presentation and then two of the others we had sent in advance, uh, hopefully so everyone got a chance to, to consider and, and brought some feedback on those today. And then we'll close up just with a work group meeting schedule and final closeout. So I know we have only an hour today, so we'll kind of run through these first ones pretty quick. I will start and then Erica Mitchell, our actuary will kind of take over on the trend approach. So as everyone knows, and as we've gone through before, uh, the department engaged GuideHouse to help reevaluate its reimbursement for the NIFs and the RCFs. And today's discussion is all gonna be about trend and inflation. So today we wanna get your thoughts on um, and take your feedback on suggested trend development methodologies. We wanna talk through some of the data sources that we're gonna to plan to use. Uh, today's data sources will not be all inclusive, but it'll give you a good idea of some of the different areas we're gonna view. And then also to provide your feedback on those data sources. And if you think there's other areas or other data that we should be including um, today, again, is to gather your feedback, so to make sure that you're heard and to make sure that we consider all your uh, comments as we kind of get through the rate setting process. Um, this is just to kind of focus on today. We showed this graphic, I believe it was in work group meeting one, but it's just our approach to developing the new rates. And as you see on the right here, we have today's focus, which is inflation and trend. Um, we've gone through the kind of items on the left, and then we have two more work group meetings after this, one on risk adjustment and one on VBP and quality. So today's we'll focus on trend. All right, last meeting, we asked specifically for some of your feedback on what suggestions you'd make to deal with unexpected high cost trends and wages. And we got some good feedback. I think we got 15 or 16 different comments and questions about this, but overwhelmingly your main comment is in that first bullet, which was the continued increase to having to use contract staff rather than permanent staff and the increased cost that permanent staff or the contract staff is taking um, to employ rather than permanent staff. You also mentioned that permanent staff is coming back to the workforce as contract staff and kind of being re-offered re to you as hireable employees uh, through the uh, work staff or through the staffing agencies at higher wages. Um, as you mentioned, they're becoming a higher problem because of the increased and in inflated rates. And then to protect the NIFs and the RCFs, you need adequate funding to account for some of these changes in the staffing models. You also suggested that we take into account age demographics uh, to account for a somewhat older population makeup in Maine, and if that could potentially cause issues on filling the workforce due to not having as many uh, younger folks to fill some of those jobs. You had definitely made a point about the health insurance cost increase of uh, roughly 15 plus percent annually as a result of COVID, so I wanted to make sure that we took into account health insurance, and it was also noted that we should consider that a fixed cost. And then also uh, considering trends by ge geographic locations and account for differing items like snow removal, heating costs, utilities uh, that are materially different by location. Um, and we wanted to remind everyone of this feedback today because we're gonna kind of get through some of these points and, and kind of talk through how we're gonna address some of these. And last, we'll just do a, a quick recap of the current trend development process. Um, so when DHHS updates rate letters in July, the NIFs and the RCFs are both inflated using BLS, Consumer Price Index for medical care services for professional, nursing home, and adult daycare. For NIFs, the direct care and routine care components are in a rebasing year. The allowable cost for the cost reports are inflated from the last day of the cost report to the last day of the fiscal year covered by the rate letter using the CPI from the December prior to the issuance letters. Uh, in non-rebasing years, there's just an additional 12 months of inflation applied from the CPI. 
And then for the RCFs for direct care routine and PCS components, they are applying a 12 month inflation using the CPI from the December from the prior issuance of the letters. So that is what has been done current or previously and currently. Um, and now we wanna get into some methodology discussion of what we are planning to do as part of this uh, redesign of the rate development process. So I am gonna turn it over to our actuary, Erica Mitchell, and let her take over. Erica, just let me know when you want me to change slides. Perfect, thanks, Justin. Um, so we're taking a little bit different approach uh, in the trend development. Um, we have heard a lot of commentary from, um, from this stakeholder group um, about some limitations of, of trend and uh, specifically related to cost pressures that Justin just walked us through. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to take a little bit of a, a different approach than I think um, normally happens. And we wanted to really kind of put all of this out for all of you to react to, um, to understand how we are trying to apply, um, I think some additional uh, precision and certainly um, additional consideration for the cost pressures that are occurring. Um, so we'll, we'll be walking through um, the steps that we'll be using. So for starters, um, the cost reports that we will be using will be fiscal year 2022. Um, it's expected that we'll have the last of those cost reports available at some point in June. So we really want to be sure, um, number one, that our starting place is the latest and greatest information. Um, so starting with fiscal year 22 um, will allow us to certainly look at the most recent cost reports available for our starting place before we end up projecting uh, the rates forward. So in using those fiscal year 2022 cost reports, we're actually going to be taking um, the underlying costs and segmenting them um, into direct expenses. Um, we're actually going to separate out electricity and heat because that certainly is a concern that you all um, voice very heavily. Um, other indirect expenses, excluding electricity and heat and capital expenses. So we're going to break out these four separate, separate buckets and we're going to be trending each of those pieces forward. <clears throat> So as we jump into the trend development, we will going into um, we will going into our work have available trends from fiscal year 22 through June 30th, 2023. We'll go into the various indices that we'll be using to complete this trend development. Um, but we we know that the cost reports we can't get. Um, we can't get everyone's cost reports through 517 2023 that's that's not feasible so the most recent we can uh, obtain is fiscal year 2022 but we do know that various indices that we'll be pulling from will be able to have data through june 30th of 2023 so rather than us estimate what trends have occurred between that point of time of fiscal year 22 and june 30th of 23 let's again use latest and greatest information available to us. Then the next piece of the trend is we still have to project what is um, what is expected to happen between July 1st of 2023 and July 1st of 2025, which is the midpoint of the rating period. So these new rates will be in effect for calendar year 2025. So that's where we'll be estimating trends based on historic patterns and um, what we anticipate to, to happen in the future. And then from there, um, steps two and three, we combine to develop a composite best estimate trend that takes us from fiscal year 2022 all the way to calendar year 2025. If we move to the next slide, it provides a little bit more detail on this high level concept about what we're trying to do. So this the, the top graphic, um, it shows again this concept of taking our base data, applying the known trends, then applying the projected trends and the best estimate trend. So for many of you, um, the many of the facilities are on a calendar year, fiscal year basis. And so at the end of the day, there'll be a full three years of trends that will be applied um, in taking that base data fiscal year 2022 all the way through calendar year 2025. So about a year of trend will, will be applied for these calendar year fiscal years using the known trend, and then we'll have to estimate um, the following two years of trend with projected trends. The table below 
This shows the four segments that we mentioned. We'll be breaking the cost reports into uh, buckets and trending each separately. So the first component is direct expense. And in that case, we'll be reviewing current uh, or um, the consumer employment statistics at a national level. Um, we'll be looking at average hourly earnings for all employees. And then separately, um, these indices are also broken out into the average hour early, average hourly earnings of production and non-supervisory workers. So we have some graphs as we move through this to show you how those um, how those trends have um, uh, the trends have developed over, over the past years, um, all the way through, I believe it's first quarter of 2023. One thing to consider in our direct cost trending is the requirement um, per part 4A that the rates must support direct care wages of at least 125% of the state minimum wage, which at this point in time, that 125% uh, of the 1380 is a $17.25 minimum wage. So obviously we wanna be sure in our projections um, that we're also uh, maintaining compliance since, since um, all the stakeholders have to stay compliant with that particular regulatory requirement. Um, the next piece, uh, electricity and heat. So we'll be using the consumer price index um, uh, we'll be looking at both the national and the Northeast levels. Um, for industry services, we're actually going to use the Northeast level in our trend development. Um, we'll show you uh, in the next couple of slides some graphs that demonstrate the national and Northeast. Um, the trend pressure that you all had mentioned, um, particularly in 2022 on the energy side, um, comes through loud and clear on the particular graph. Um, so thank you all for, for noting that as far as an element where you're really experiencing pressure so that we can um, separately break out that item. Then the next two items, so the under, other indirect, so it's all the indirect experiences excluding uh, electricity and heat, and then capital, we'll be using the producer price index um, for nursing facilities, um, and, and then also there's another segment that we'll be using for, um, for the RCS. Um, so, that, so that PPI, what it represents is um, across all of the expenditures um, for this group to bring their services to market, it represents that cost increase. So actually the PPI, it does include direct expenses, it includes electricity and heat, it includes other indirect and capital. But the reason that we've broken out this trending into these separate buckets is to really um, kind of call out and acknowledge the fact that there have been some pretty intense cost pressures um, for direct expenses. You all have experienced very high level wage increases um, as well as electricity and heat. So if we move forward to the next slide, um, we share some graphs on these particular indices um, that we have just noted in the prior slide. So, um, this first slide is taking a look at the CPIU trend for energy services. And I wanna ground everyone the, um, the additional graphs that we will be going through follow um, kind of a similar color scheme and, and layout on the slide. So um, on this particular slide, Northeast energy services are the green line. Um, and you'll see that it tracks pretty similarly with the national energy services. Um, the reason that we think it is more appropriate to use Northeast Energy Services in our production is while the lines track pretty similarly, you will see in 2022 that there was a bit of a gap um, between the Northeast Energy Services, which experienced from 2021 to 2022 a 20% increase versus nationally there was more of a 16% increase. So we do want to, to, to acknowledge the fact um, that you all are in Maine and that a Northeast uh, energy increase is more representative of what you experience versus the national trend that would include states such as California, Florida, and Texas. Um, the other item that we wanted to point out on this particular slide is all of the percentages that we have graphed here, those are year over year changes. And you'll see that save for 2015 and 2016, uh, also 2019, um, all of those trend years, those increases have been above zero, which means from one year to the next, 
you all have been experiencing cost inflation. Now, if we move all the way to the far right of the slide for um, 2023 quarter one, you'll notice that those annual trends have softened a little bit from 2022, but they're still higher than what was experienced prior to 2020. So um, the annual trend uh, in first quarter of 23, uh, moving from 2022 to 2023, was about an 8.4% increase uh, in the Northeast and a little bit lower nationally at a 4.8% increase. So the fact that you're seeing the line drop from 2022 to 2023, um, overall, the cost is still increasing, but not at such a high acute level. So still, still trend pressure, 8.4% is higher than what you all experienced in prior years other than 22, but not quite at that just really acute year over year increase level of about 20% um, that, that was experienced in the Northeast for 22. If we move forward um, to the next slide, we start to um, we start to take a look at the Bureau of Labor and Statistics historic trend, um, and this is for the PPI component. So we noted earlier we'll be using PPI trend um, on the indirect expenses as well as um, the capital expenditures. And um, you'll see if we are over on the left, the green line represents nursing care facilities for Medicaid patients where the blue line that is a little bit lower um, represents trends in aggregate for nursing care facilities across all payers, be it Medicare, Medicaid, private pay, uh, et cetera. Um, so we, we intend um, to use the, for nursing care facilities, to use the PPI nursing care trend for Medicaid patients, acknowledging the fact that the Medicaid specific trend um, has been accelerating um, and, and so you'll note that um, in, in 2014 to 2019, trends were in the kind of 2 to 4% to range. Um, but in the last couple of years, the trends have accelerated to a certain degree. Um, in fact, for 2023 quarter one, um, that annual trend rate was more in the 7.3% range. So certainly, um, as you all have been noting the trend pressures you're experiencing, um, the, PPI, the PPI does, to, uh, to at least a certain degree, reflect the, the trend pressures you've been experiencing. If we move to the right, there isn't, uh, there isn't a residential care facility um, BLS breakout. Um, so we, we have a, what we consider to be perhaps a bit of a proxy. Um, we've grabbed the residential developmental disability home trend um, as a possible proxy. Um, you'll note that there is um, a little bit of a divergence um, between the Medicaid patient trend in green and the overall residential developmental disability trend across all payers. So in um, 2023 quarter one, the Medicaid patient or uh, residential disability trend dropped to about three and a half percent. Um, versus about 5.6% um, across all payers. If we move forward to slide 11, we then jump into um, the trends that uh, have been experienced from a wage level standpoint. So you all have, have noted, and, and certainly we've heard this across other stakeholder groups outside of Maine, the, the severe wage pressures that you all have experienced, especially as there's a lot of pressure um, for, for labor moving to contract labor. Um, and so you'll see on the left, again, we have um, skilled nursing facilities. Um, there is a one-to-one, -one, there is actually a Bureau of Labor and Statistics uh, category for skilled nursing facilities. And again, in green, um, in this case, the green represents non-supervisory workers while the blue uh, line represents um, all employees. So that would include supervisory. For, for um, the nursing facilities, the, the trends between supervisory versus all employees have tracked pretty consistently over the last few years. Um, there is about a half a percent then, um, difference uh, for 2022 
um, where the non-supervisory workers have about a nine and a half percent year over year trend, where it's a little bit lower at not, but not much uh, at a nine percent trend level for all employees. And so um, the, the gap we presume is because the non-supervisory workers are where you're experiencing some more of that contract labor pressure. Um, you still are in, 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 you still are experiencing wage pressure for supervisory workers, but perhaps not at quite that same level uh, of increase. Still high. Um, so certainly the, the recent 9% are, are higher than if we look back to 2014 to, to 2018 and more of that 2% year over year level of increase. And then for, um, for RCFs, again, there isn't a one-to-one -to -one mapping. Um, so what we are showing as, as a possibility um, is assisted living facility trends um, that have occurred over the last few years. You'll see um, similar wage pressure um, that is over in the, the left chart with the, the skilled nursing facilities um, in the most recent year for non-supervisory workers um, that the trend is around the 9% range. So pretty, pretty similar um, to, to what we've seen for, for SNF and then a little bit lower um, for ALF uh, employees, for, for all employees, including supervisors. So that's at about a 7.7% increase but again, um, certainly higher than historic norms um, that, that were experienced before the pandemic. So with that, we wanted to, to kind of level set number one on the overall approach, the fact that we are um, going to be trending each of those four components separately using different trend rates. And number two, we thought it would be helpful um, to level set as far as what the, the trend levels have looked like from these indices uh, in the most recent years so that you all um, at least have kind of a framework as we're jumping into this um, of, of what those recent trends have looked like. So I think with that, Justin, we were going to segue um, into uh, the feedback portion. Yes, um, before we do that, I did want to just take a chance. Everyone will have a chance to respond to the, the open discussion, but were there any specific questions on the slides that Erica showed or um, areas that anyone wanted to comment on before we move into the open discussion? I'm not sure, Angela, I can't really hear you. I'm not sure if that's just me or... No, it's really, really quiet. Still pretty soft. Okay. How about now? Let's keep going. I'll put <laughs> no. it in the chat. Okay. In the chat. Sorry. No worries. Any other questions or comments before we move along? Angela, it seems like your mic just isn't quite picking up. Um, I don't know if it's underneath something. <laughs> okay. All right, so if I don't see any more questions, we will move into the open discussion. Um, again, we've done this in the past, but I'm gonna turn it over to Danielle. She's going to kind of lead through the discussion and then I will copy and paste all of your comments from the chat. We ask that you do include them in the chat if possible. Um, we will, of course, take into account any verbal questions as well. Um, but the goal again here is to put some thought into each of the questions and provide your feedback so that we can take that away with us after today's meeting. So Danielle, I will turn it over to you to lead the discussion. Yeah, thanks so much. Hey, everyone. Um, so we've, we've been here before, but we're either going to hopefully type all of our answers in the chat if not, Justin, um, you can you can raise your hand and talk, and then Justin will also notate those downs onto the slides. Um, but you know, don't focus on wordsmithing. Just kind of put your reaction to the question, so we can have a collaborative and productive conversation. Um, and if you can come on camera, we um, love to see people's faces here. So we can go on to the next slide, and there is a highlight of each of our three questions. So our Danielle, first before we, mm -hmm. before we jump in, can we can we address um, 
can we address uh, question the two questions? Yeah. Um, so the first the first question from Angela is related to um, the rate model timing and its delivery. So whether or not it will be ready for January 2025. And um, they've also heard of late the rates will be ready in 2024. Um, and was curious if Guidehouse or the department could um, confirm the timing. Paul, do you want to take that or do you want me to? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to take it, Peter. So the goal continues to be to implement the new rate model in January of 2025. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> ah, I found my headset. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank yeah, you, Paul. And then on the latter, on Tammy's question, um, uh, yeah, I mean, right now we inflate through the last day of the rate letter period. And um, because the uh, new rates will go into effect 1125, and Erica had put up on the screen that they're inflating through 63025. Um, I mean, assuming that we're, we're still going to even though the new rate letters, even though the new rates will go into effect one one twenty five, we would still stay on that state fiscal year schedule. So the those first letters are only going to cover one one twenty five through six thirty twenty five. And so when it, when Erica had put up there that it'll be inflated through six thirty five, it is through the the last day of the rate letter period, and then we would just continue. Uh, the current practice after that of, of inflating through the last day. And let me, let me, um, Pierre, that was a good answer. Let me just add one more piece of context because this is where I think actuaries don't necessarily approach trend as, as the way that other folks might. So from an actuarial standpoint, you trend from the midpoint of the base data period to the midpoint of the projection period. So when you hear us say we're trending to 630 of 25, we're actually trending all the way to the end of the rate period. It's just um, it's just this midpoint to midpoint concept, which I know is unfamiliar to, to folks who don't do this um, every day. <clears throat> but yeah, as Erica said, it would be a one year rate that we would be developing with June 30th as the midpoint. All right. All right, I will turn it back over to you, Jenny. There was there was one more question in there. I don't know if you wanted to address it before we jump in. And I think that will be an audit question. Um, okay. Herb, can you speak about Section GG? What exactly is Section GG? Just to level set for everyone. Or Tricia? Peter, this is Rick from Genesis. It's my question. And what is GG is under the public health emergency. The state of Maine has generously provided three series of grant payments, cash advances to the provider to deal with the emergency publicly, public health situation for there. Initially, you know, we were using it, it needed to be uh, specifically identified, you needed purchase services, or you were paying short staff bonuses, retention bonuses, all of that cost. But the reality of the industry is everything is embedded. And it's really not as clear cut as auditors would love it to be for this, dealing with it for three years, like you're saying, we've gone from a public health emergency medical crisis to a workforce solution crisis that we're dealing with. And they really dovetail together. We appreciate the funds for Maine, but it's like, but being able to point to cost that cost should be consolidated in rebasing because it's almost impossible to say that cost 
is outside the public health, you know, relates to the public health emergency. And I just want to, you know, we're in the process of filing cost reports and knowing, you know, where do we stand with the GG sort of reconciliation to the rebase? The history of the audit department, they've rebased every odd year. Now I'm just finding out 22 is my rebase. I've completed the cost reports, but haven't filed them. <laughs> so, uh, Rick, I'm hearing you. At, okay, go ahead, Herb. No, I was just going to say, Paul, that, you know, the, uh, first of all, just to clarify, audit doesn't do the rebasing. That's Peter's group. Rate setting does that, um, just, just to be clear. But from an audit standpoint, we'll, we'll use GG for audit purposes, just to come up with what the settlement will be. The numbers Peter's group will use for rebasing will probably exclude those, although I don't know that decision has been made fully, but I think the last time we rebased, we excluded those extra funds from that. So um, my, my guess is the GG will have no impact on the rebasing. And it'll, it'll be a wider discussion. Um, so, I mean, thank you for raising it, Rick. This is, I mean, it's, it, it's, it, this has to be vetted quite thoroughly within the department. So I'm really not prepared to speak about it now. Um, it will be a topic for discussion. Right. But I, uh, but my topic is I've got to file cost reports in 10 days. <laughs> um, okay. I mean, I would, I would just, I mean, I defer to her, but I would yeah, think. That, that, that quite honestly, sorry to interrupt you, Peter, but that should have no impact on how you file your cost report, Rick. Okay, I'm hearing a, a bit of a pause now. I think maybe we can jump into this section. We have about 20 minutes here. So we have these three questions we're gonna cover. Um, one about RCFs in which two consumer employment statistic indices best represent your place of service. So we can go jump to that one on slide 14. And so think about this for a second. Please write your, your um, type in the chat. If you're not able to, you can uh, feel free to call it out and Justin will um, paste that onto the screen so we can all see them together. Are you referring to the Northeast? versus the US, is that what you're asking about? I think what we're referring to is on the uh, previous slides where we showed the CES, I've moved back to that slide. Um, right. For skilled nursing facility and assisted living, you know, between the, as you said, the, the Northeast or the Medicaid specific in this case and uh, non-Medicaid, and these two, which do you think best reflect a res residential care facility? Would it be SNF? Would it be ELF? Would it be one of these uh, specific lines? So just looking for feedback on what you think is most appropriate uh, specifically for the RCFs. Oh, for RCFs. Yeah, because for nursing facilities, we're gonna use the, the skilled nursing facility. And RCF also- It doesn't have a one-to-one -one match. And to remind folks, the CES is used for the direct care to inflate the direct care component. Um, CPI would be used for um, for capital and for other fixed. All right. Justin, Justin, can I suggest that you also paste in the GG question just so we oh, don't- sure. Lose track of it. Thank yeah, you. I'll actually put all of these in here. This is Angela again. I, I think the the pause is because some of us aren't very familiar with CES indices. Uh, you know, we we've worked primarily with uh, CPI indexes uh, specific to nursing homes or the urban wage earners one. So this isn't one that I'm particularly familiar with. So that that's kind of I think why some of us are being quiet. <laughs> <coughs> So we have one answer so far where we're talking about sniff trending being more applicable here. Ooh. 
Let's see where we are. Okay, <clears throat> see a couple answers coming in now. Thank you, David and Glenn. Very, very helpful feedback. Does anyone want to elaborate on, on um, an answer that they put in? This is Glenn Sear, Senior Vice President of Finance for North Country Associates in Lewiston, and we own and operate 25 facilities throughout Maine. And my comment was that many of our facilities in Maine are shared services within the same confines or building. I know that there are other uh, independent or uh, standalone facilities as well. So um, I know that that can be a challenge or we may have some slight differences, but I think the overall concept is I'd like to see consistency as much as possible. And I would comment also that I appreciate the information that was provided to date so far. I'm, I'm, I am pleased to see that the inflation factors and the other things that you guys have presented so far seem to be a little more market representative than what we've had in the past, which is basically not what we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you. Glenn, on your comment uh, about um, multi-levels or, or whatever the situation is. So for example, would you be offering the same wage to a nurse or a CNA in either the PNMI or the, the SNF? Is there no differential in terms of what you pay? There is a differential, uh, Paul, um, because obviously the, the level of care and the amount of demands that the job has between a skilled facility and a residential care facility, but it's the inflation portion of it that is important. Because if you have a base wage, and I'm just taking numbers out of the air, but if you have a base wage of $20 an hour for a, a, a CNA in a nursing facility, and let's say $16 in a residential care, we have shared staff, and the percentage of increase of that wage needs to be consistent. That's where I'm coming from when I make that comment. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is, this is David Dill from New Communities. Um, I'll just add to, to my comment, um, you know, and my comment is really just that, you know, the inflation I think is certainly what we've been experiencing from a wage perspective, but with our turnover, you know, part of the reason that we have so much turnover is because we can't pay employees enough to stay. Um, and so, then that's really, you know, comes back to the, the rates, right? So I, I understand that it's kind of definitely related, but at the same time, just wanted to, you know, highlight that really that inflation factor from a wage perspective would be higher if we had the funds to pay employees an hourly rate that would want them to stay and be more consistent and less turnover. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. Yeah, and uh, just to Glenn's point about the inflation that's been used up until now, really not keeping pace with cost. Um, yeah, I mean, that, as, as everybody on the call knows, um, that inflation rate, well, first of all, it's specified, it's required by statute. Um, and so... Uh, and it's only sort of bumped around in the three and a half to four and a half uh, percent range really for years. Um, and I, I don't know why the legislature chose that particular index because that index is based on what patients pay. Uh, it, is, it is the consumer uh, index, not a producer index. So it's, I it's, think it was recommended by the healthcare association, uh, is, is, uh, where it came from. Yeah. Agreed. I just was sort of, <laughs> it was assumed. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, the fact that these are producer indices as opposed to consumer, that's why they reflect the cost of the inflation of the, of the inputs. And that's why you're seeing these, you know, being basically in that eight to 9% range for the past year or two, as opposed to the 4%. Um, 
So um, it's quite a change. It will be quite a change. And uh, of course, it'll have to be approved by the legislature because we will have to take out, you know, that existing index. And this is Glenn Sear again from North Country Associates. And to your point, Peter, um, I want to go back to Rick's point when he discussed the uh, state emergency funding for the public health emergency. The inflation that we've received as providers over the last several years, obviously with what we're experiencing today, those funds are really what has supported the industry. There would have been massive closures if those funds were not given out to providers. And we are still on the brink, regardless of what we're going through today. So I just want to make sure that that is considered, and I understand that it has to be part of the rate structure, but I just want everyone to know on this call that those funds are really to make up for the inflational differences and the industry differences that have exploded on us. So there needs to be uh, that as part of the conversation. Just to take, I am very pleased to hear 2022 is the year that you're selecting. I think that the department, along with uh, uh, legislative officials, are going to be quite amazed to see how much money is being spent for uh, contract labor in the state of Maine. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars and it's just the environment that we're in. So I just wanna make sure that uh, people keep that on their radar, but I do appreciate what's been said so far today. So thank you. And just so I'm clear, Glenn, you're, you're seconding, seconding the uh, suggestion that the GG expenditures be, be recognized as part of rebasing. Absolutely, 100%. All right, hearing a pause and, and looking at time. So let's move on to, yep, slide 15 there. So what's your expectation of be the future of the annual wage inflation rates? So um, just to add more color to that, um, we've seen what has happened over the last few years and the various graphs that we shared with you all. Um, whenever there are periods of high inflation at a certain point in the U.S., we've seen the inflation begin to temper and perhaps come down. So what we're really trying to understand is um, just, just like we saw with the heating, just because the trend was 20% um, year over year from 20 to 21, the, the inflation did abate some from 21 to 22. So we're trying to kind of understand what you all are thinking um, for the future. Can I just, can I bring in some commentary from here? And this is, this is, you know, but again, the, this is just a huge global problem, macro, that's affecting micro at the nursing home level. But again, the issue we're dealing with is the replacement staff that we need in the nursing home of the future is just not readily available right now. Young people are not going into the nursing home. It is an honorable profession, but it's never perceived as a prestigious area of work. And I know on the previous calls I mentioned with the increase of the living wage that is needed, it's putting the nursing homes in competition for that labor that can, you know, that doesn't have to do the hard laborious work of a CNA. And the CNA is the backbone of the nursing home. So we need a trained staff. States, you know, now some of this, and that what I'm saying is that the only way the nursing homes are going to get these people are to pay more to get them the money to come to us. I don't know where the state is and some states are doing like, you know, developing college training programs so that they can get that better supply of geriatric CNAs or anything that can maintain, that the supply drives the cost. If we have more to hire, 
we can control better our costs when we are fighting with all of our competitors to get that CNA in, the CNA's choice is based on dollar. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, so I'm, I'm hearing consensus on just increasing competition with hiring and increasing wages, and it's, it's um, not uh, something that's easy to keep up with. I'm hearing, uh, yeah, go ahead. Regarding your prior slides where you were discussing trending, how accurate is the history of your trending? Because we're, my understanding is you're using trending to predict future wage uh, inflation increase. Am I correct? So what we'll be doing is we'll be taking a look at um, experience over the last 10 or so years. Um, we talked about we're starting with the fiscal year 22 cost report. So that's that's our starting place. And then, yes, we will be looking at historic trends to predict the future. Um, as far as uh, recent work, um, we did some work with another state within the last six or 12 months. Um, and our trends were, were fairly accurate. Um, we ended up starting with one year cost report. We ended up refreshing our work and using a more recent cost report. Um, but, but it is, I mean, it is a production. So projections never are perfectly aligned with what ends up transpiring. Is 30 years ago, there was a company called Data Resources Inc. out of New Hampshire that control the inflationary increase for Maine nursing homes. And that was eventually done away with, and I don't know if they even still exist. Are there any known companies that publish inflation predictors by industry? And maybe those could be Not to used alongside your trending? Um, so, to the best of, of my knowledge, no, but one of the items, um, one of the outputs or deliverables that we'll have as part of this exercise is taking a look. Um, we have multiple years of cost reports from this group. And so we will be looking at how, how the actual cost reports have been trending in recent years and compare that to the indices as an additional um, gut check to see if there's any indices that feel like they are um, an optimal fit uh, as far as you, the, this group's actual experience um, versus the index, but I'm not, I'm not aware. Um, but others on this call may may have an awareness. The the only comment or advice I'd have is that the rate of of increase has been very steep in the most uh, one, two, three years. Absolutely. And, and we have to uh, we have to focus on that for the next two or three years, because as was pointed out, until we have adequate supply of staff, the pressures are gonna keep driving the cost out. Yeah, we have a couple comments on that in the chat. And then um, once Justin gets those, we can jump to our last question. Yeah, I think I got them all. Yep. Yep. All right. So curious your thoughts here. So when do you expect inflation to moderate? I know no one said that so far. <laughs> I think it'll moderate when the US government gets their immigrant visa situation under control and then we can take those tens of thousands of people showing up at the southern border and put them to work in our nursing homes.
other than an increase in the supply of workers, mm -hmm. what we have is what we're going to continue to have. Yeah, so so I'm hearing just uh, commentary around the, the supply of workers. Yes, a crystal ball, that would definitely work. Um, yeah, a lot of factors. This is Glenn Sear from North Country Associates again. And, and the question is a good question that can't be answered because of the environment that we're in. Uh, going back to comments of regarding a workforce, because of Maine's stagnant population, because of our distance and how we are kind of structured in the state of Maine all over the place, uh, and the workforce, and, and, and frankly, the nursing agency dominance of providing labor, not just in Maine, but across this country right now, is going to continue to create this. And please know that all nursing agencies are private businesses and are in the business of profit. And not just the main care program, but all Medicaid programs across this country, they're very in tune to that and they know that. And their price structure and their future price structure is going to be dictated based on policies made by state governments. And so they're fully aware of all this and you can read all the papers and you can see all of the trends and you can see that our large organizations are buying these agencies nationally because it's a huge profit center for them. So again, to look in the future to say, how can we, or will there be a controlling or reduction of inflation? It's gonna be driven by the labor portion that will dictate the price structure first. And then we're always gonna be playing catch up. So that's why we're always gonna be behind the eight ball in this. So it's just gonna be a very challenging time, not just for Maine, for the country. I don't have the answers, but we all know this on this call. We know this is where it's headed and where it's going right now. So we appreciate the work you've done. We appreciate that, but this is not something that can just get solved or assume that our price structure is gonna go down over the next couple of years. It's just not. I'd yeah. Like to, I'd, I'd like to point out a, a typo on number four that was just uh, written to reflect Glenn's comments. Uh, he said all nursing agencies are private and for-profit not nursing homes. Thank you. So looking at um, Israel's comment and also what Glenn just noted, do any of you have any thoughts on strategies uh, in terms of how the rate structure could help you reduce agency staffing? It's probably not a feasible answer, but if you made labor a fixed cost and let us pay what the market is demanding to steal from non-health care industries, that's about the only answer I can think of, but it would be very expensive. Um, More, as expensive as agency staff? Probably not. No, it wouldn't. So if I could just add in response to the agency staffing um, question that was in the chat, um, part of the, the main healthcare association workforce group, um, there, there are some bills moving forward in the legislature. And one of them is specific to agency staffing that um, specifically in the state of Maine, the requirements would change uh, to increase the amount of money required to register as a staffing agency within the state, uh, because I believe that is flooded with basically anyone who wants to do contract labor in the state. Um, it's a small like $15 fee to register. So the, the hope is to increase that to limit um, and actually gain revenue, but then also um, force the staffing agencies to reveal what the contract labor was set for and what was actually paid to the employee through the agency. So whatever the, the, the nursing home paid to the staffing agency and then what the staffing agency paid to the employee. Uh, and we're hoping with some, some clarity there, it would potentially turn workforce labor into direct labor.
Wanda, were you wanting to jump in on this question as well? Oh yeah, well, I was just gonna echo what Gab Gabrielle had to say about that. We do have a bill in session and uh, it's really intended to shine a bright light on what they charge and the what, what we believe is profiteering by this cottage industry that's just exploded and is a big, big problem for us. And it's a tremendous waste of taxpayer dollars as the state of Maine continues to increase rates to cover the costs that are charged by these agencies. Uh, I think the other important part of this LD, um, you know, and, and another route to go is to enforce the proper use of these untaxed stipends that agencies pay the employees that's intended to be for duplicative uh, housing and meals expenses. And we think we feel as an industry that there's abuse of that uh, tax free stipend uh, to those who are really not entitled to it. So hoping that the state can partner with us to investigate that as well. All right. Well, thank you everyone for your feedback. Unfortunately, we are down to just the last two minutes, uh, but uh, feel free to please, if you have additional comments or questions uh, after we get off the call today, please feel free to email them. Uh, slide 18 we have, please send additional comments to Brian and myself with our emails in here. We welcome any and all additional feedback you'd like us to consider or any other um, comments that you'd like to make after this call. We would ask that you try to uh, include those by the end of this week as we wrap up kind of the summary of today's call, um, but we do welcome those questions. And then finally, this was our third meeting today. Uh, the next meeting will be June 5th. Everyone should have that on their calendar where we're gonna talk through risk adjustment. And then on June 26th will be the final kind of work group meeting on the methodology and the, the process of developing rates. And that'll be around VBP and quality. Again, Questions and comments can be submitted through the rest of the week and then contacts from the Guidehouse team. So I appreciate everyone's time today. Uh, I very much appreciate all the feedback we've received from you throughout this process, and I wish everyone a great day. <laughs>